Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is a SAS gal in DC land with my friend Maya Benson. How's it going, Maya? Hi, Joe. Great. Happy Halloween. <laughs> yes, that's right. T- today is Halloween. Who knows when this will post, but <laughs> we are talking on Halloween. We're talking on Halloween. So, Maya, I'm excited to talk to you finally. Please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Joe, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad finally we get to connect. I know we've tried to do this a couple of times. Maya Benson coming to you live today from a really sunny, gorgeous fall, New York. And thrilled to be talking to you. I know you're back home in Michigan as a Chicago native. Found fond memories of your neck of the woods. Very nice. I know when you're from the Midwest, you always miss this time of year, but you don't necessarily miss the next part of this. <laughs> right. Yeah, we can just skip the winter. Yes, exactly. Maya, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling. And you're in New York, I know, but please introduce yourself. Fantastic. Your Maya, introductions. Joe, I'm a 20 year SaaS product and platform exec, really building first ever SaaS products and platforms for big corporate for about 15 years, which meant I was like tip of the spear, dragging them into the digital and data-driven world. As I said out loud, it's really great to have built-in distribution. It's really great to have a salary, but really everything else on the transformation side is like climbing Everest on a 140-degree day with all the ice just gushing in your face. I got really lucky. A small Canadian company called and said, hey, we're pretty good at technical R&D, but we're new new to all things strategy, pricing, go-to-market, taking third-party tech, putting it on our APIs, commercializing our APLs, all sorts of fun stuff like that. So joined Shopify as their second US employee and really built and grew everything zero to one, zero to 10, zero to Bs for self-embedded shipping, the outsourced thing, fulfillment thing that became the Shopify Fulfillment Network, and then was an early, early co-founder of the Shop app as well. So I had a blast living between New York and Canada for over five years. I left in 21, became a founder myself. Joe jumped off the cliff, co-founded a luxury fashion NFT company with my kind of commerce chops, rolled that into another company in 22. And as I wanted, thought about what I wanted to do next, Joe, I had been in personally investing and advising some companies and some venture capital firms. And every night I went to bed, I was like, more founders, bigger wallets. So that's where the tug was. And got very fortunate to meet my current company, Forum Ventures, along the journey and realized their model for early stage investment just dip, deeply resonated with me as not only a founder, but a business builder for, for many years. And, and really that differentiation is in, yes, we deploy capital, but we also deploy a lot of help and support. So no one's born knowing how to raise venture capital No one's born knowing all the go-to-market first principles and tips and tricks in those early days to get to proof in market that you've got something that people want to pay for. And so those core anchors are what really drew me to to forum. So new a year new to venture capital, Joe. Um, Excited to share some trends that we're seeing today and kind of the the next generation of logistics. And hopefully that's a helpful Maya intro. Yeah. um, Yes, it is. And so... um... I know a few things we want to talk about, and but in, in a minute, I want to talk to you about Shopify because before we hit record, I was telling you, I think I am probably like many other people in logistics and supply chain going, yeah, Shopify is a super important company. They do uh, so very important things, <laughs> but I'm not exactly sure what they do. So I want to talk to you about what Shopify does. I know we wanted to touch on Convoy and it, it, it is... We have a, a positive take on that. We'll talk about that. And then we, I do want to talk about some of the trends. What interests you guys? VCs are still out there spending money and investing in companies and growing companies, but it's different than it was a few years ago, obviously. So I wanted to, so we'll circle back and talk about those in a minute. Tell us about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career. You already gave us some career highlights, but. I have my intro on the personal side, and I love that you dig into this, Joe. As I mentioned, you and I are shared Midwesterners, so grew up most of my life in Chicago, moved out east to New York to go to undergrad at Syracuse University. Very nice. Moved west to San Francisco in the Valley for really dot-com boom one, Joe. So late 90s and early 2000s. 
I live the roller coaster number one and then the crash number one out there. Just amazing days. Really saw a lot of tech being birthed from the inside out. So amazing founders building really next generation, amazing tech, but not knowing or building with their customers. So coming to folks like me at market research, tech market research data companies like IDC saying, where does my product fit? And so as I saw all this, I had this hypothesis like, why don't you just build products with your customers, <laughs> build tech with your customers? And so that brought me back to business school. So I had this hypothesis, a great way to kind of change gears or careers is through through an MBA. So I came back to upstate New York for more winter fun at Cornell University. So did my full-time MBA there and graduated and really got lucky with being able to start building first ever, like I said, SaaS products and platforms for big corporate. So that that's a little bit on the my personal front. So let's talk about SaaS. So everybody says SaaS all the time now. And by the way, now I'm hearing so SaaS stands for software as a service, which means, which, so just, what's the difference between SaaS and the way we used to do it? Yeah, Joe, you and I remember the way we used to do it. <laughs> so, so software, when you and I wanted to leverage new software programs, games, work programs, we'd get out our floppy disk or then our hard disks and we'd keep in our computer, Right. And we'd use the software locally. So that's how you and I grew up in the early days of software. And really with the advent of, of cloud computing and really the originators of uh, Salesforce, we started putting that software in a cloud or remotely for companies then to access through a license and on demand. So really it's that transition from hardware being resident in our computers or local servers to to the cloud and being available to all of us on whatever device we're leveraging through the internet. And I think the way we used to look at software is you would buy it up front and it would be a big expense. You'd buy some sort of software, you'd load it with disks or whatever. And then every quarter there'd be updates. You'd get new disks and your guy would over the weekend some guy who you all had to be super nice to because he seemed to run the company the tech guy and your everything would shut down over the weekend and you were hoping on Monday everything worked. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Like you'd spend a fortune, you'd get updates over time and and I think the service uh, name in that software as a service component is really also the business model game change, right? So now we subscribe to access software either on a monthly or an annual basis. Yeah, and I don't have to have the big down payment. Now I just pay right away. And by the way, I know now where I just talked to somebody who's doing robots as a service, which means I don't have that big downstroke, big down payment for my robot. I think what it also le lends itself to better is more uptime, uh, which we all want and expect from our software providers now. But I think it also means I have a relationship. I don't buy it and then wave bye-bye to the guy and hope they stay in business long enough to support me. They are, they are my partner. And also the updates happen and they usually happen with behind the scenes. You don't know they happen. So it was a huge upgrade when we went to software as a service because it's less upfront expense. By the way, a lot of people would say, I need that TMS or ERP or new finance program. And wouldn't get it because it was a big expense and implementation. That's a whole nother thing that was way harder also. So software as a service transformed software as we know it. Yeah. And it transformed like the people, the product development of it, because we have such dynamic real-time data coming from its usage. So I think transformed it for the user and the payer and the business model, but it also really transformed it for the makers of that software because they could see hyper dynamically, basically real time, how the product's being used and where it's where it's easy to use and where it's faltering. Yep. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about Shopify. So you were there a long time. You that was a rocket ship. You said you were one of the early employees. How many employees do they have now? Over 90, I think 9,500, 9,000 ish. So yeah, when I joined, I think we we're about six, 700 employees. And absolute growth rocket ship had an absolute blast building first ever in scaling first ever things for them. 
And yeah, just an amazing experience. For every one of the people who said, yes, I was on the Shopify rocket ship, there's somebody else who was on another rocket ship that crashed early. <laughs> so I, I worked for a Silicon Valley company and I remember thinking, God, this is taking off. This is growing like a weed. But our main investor was big into Google <laughs> and Google was blowing up. And I remember they're like, we don't want to go to your meetings because we have Google. <laughs> and then we're like, you're growing, but not fast enough. We're like, there's, we're growing like a weed. We're celebrating million dollar deals every week. And there's only like 10 of us. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah, big gamble when I chose to join. In fact, I talked to a couple investors. So before Shopify, I had built products for SMBs for a long time and deeply knew you had to have a model where you could afford to acquire these small businesses that tended to pay you little in revenue, right? So that cost act of acquisition versus like, how much you could get from them on the revenue side was a real hurdle. And so before I joined Shopify, they were growing like a weed from an SMB perspective. But it was still like, geez, is there enough money to make to pay for those costs of acquisition? So the big bet was really the democratization of commerce on the internet. And is that tailwind right from a timing perspective now to really to lift what became a D to C revolution. And we, we had great tech and we were lucky with the timing because there were several other companies that came before us that were really successful CMS and web platforms, but didn't get the benefit of that, that D to C revolution. Yep. So I want to talk about Shopify for a second, because I think I never truly understand what they do. So let's just say I um, I open a sweater store and I started entirely online. And then somebody says, Joe, you need to get Shopify. Why am I buying Shopify? I know I'm buying it. Why am I buying it? Yeah. So first of all, I think Shopify, we want to make that point clear. Frequently, I get a lot of still Spotify. So I think it's important to, to focus oh, on yeah. that. I have, I have done that because I'm a Spotify listener. <laughs> yeah, for the first year I worked at Shopify, my mom told everyone I worked for Spotify. That happens. Anyway, Shopify is an omni-com, omni-channel commerce platform. So to your right kind of frame there, Joe, if you wanted to start selling sweaters tomorrow, Shopify has democratized really the experience for you to easily set up your store, easily to start taking payments and easily start fulfilling your orders all from their platform. And you can do that by selling on Joe's joesweatershop.com, going direct to that consumer, or you can do it by leveraging their platform to sell it on other channels like the Walmarts of the world, the Ebays of the world, the Pinterest of the world. So anyway, sell everywhere is their mantra. So I have the, my online store and I'm driving traffic to it. And again, that's a whole different skill set than logistics and the fulfillment. But in between there's, I have a store for, I have to get a basket, right? So people put that stuff in a basket and there's a whole science behind that. And I know this, I leave a lot of baskets and that's a big problem in the, in the e-commerce space where you go, you're oh. abandoning it. No, you're abandoning the cart. Yes. So I put a whole bunch of stuff in there and I go, God, I'm going to need something else. I'll wait or I shouldn't make this big purchase or whatever I'm doing. It just it might, it might not even just run out of time. So can they get me on, if I want to sell through Amazon, can Shopify help me or do I, is that a separate situation? No, yeah, no. Shopify has an integration with Amazon so they can push some of your SKUs into Amazon. So those wires are there. Again, as in Walmart, Pinterest, all the Google shopping uh, ads and kind of experience. Everywhere I want to sell, they'll help me. Instagram, Etsy, still no yeah. partnership. TikToks just changed. They weren't partnerships, but TikToks go in their own way. So really it's, it's a sell everywhere, maximize your gross merchandise value, the amount of stuff you sell and really meet and greet your consumer audience wherever they live. Now, did they, will they do the fulfillment for me or... Joe, this is now my baby. So, yes. So if you want to fulfill the orders yourself, so if Joe's getting about 10 orders a day, I'm going to pack and then ship the orders. That's all embedded in Shopify through a product called Shopify Shipping. So that's one uh, avenue. We had built Shopify Fulfillment to be that embedded fulfillment 
experience and the app for that still exists. So there's still a thing called Shopify Fulfillment as an app. It's now powered by really Flexport. So we had acquired Deliver. So it was powered by Shopify Fulfillment with the Deliver acquisition rolling underneath. And then they sold Deliver to Flexport. So now that Shopify fulfillment is really powered by our Flexport. So that's not necessarily getting. So I think we all saw the news the other day. Shopify is diverse or divesting themselves of Deliver or they sold Deliver to Flexport. That wasn't them getting out of the business. That was them doubling down in the business because Flexport has quite a bit of, I don't know what the right, right word is, I guess, capability. And is that what is that why they did it? Conversation, because what you're right about is in a way they were doubling down because they have an investment, their shareholder in Flexport. So that part is very true. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, yes. They also took that core value and put it within a third party, right? So it's now with Flexport. And then coincidentally, I think the optics on this looked like it was a lot more architected than it candidly was. But right around the same time, they partnered with Amazon on Buy With Prime, right? And so now you've got a message to merchants that's, hey, we can still help you with Shopify Fulfillment Network powered by Flexport and or you can now use Buy With Prime and all of the Amazon FBA infrastructure to drive fulfillment for your business as well. So I think that's a really interesting evolution on Shopify saying, hey, we know Prime has won with consumers. You've got 80 plus percent of the US population that's paying for Prime. Why don't we help Shopify merchants leverage the power of Prime to drive more conversion, help our merchants sell more? I think that was the strategic logic. You and I can talk about the pros and the cons to that decision, but... <coughs> I think there's an embedded message now that, yes, you can use Shopify for fulfillment. There's also a rich partner ecosystem, the ship heroes, the ship bobs of the world that also help merchants fulfill. And then lastly, now there's a pretty clear message that, hey, you can use buy with Prime and any Amazon infrastructure to fulfill your orders. Yeah. And I think we, we've had, we've sold it more brick and mortar forever. We, we understood that. And that was largely shipping LTL truckload to retail locations. And that was not an easy business, never been an easy business. And, but it's gotten very difficult now with the idea of, if I'm, if I have to I'll get back to my Joe's sweaters for a second, I'm selling some on Amazon. I'm selling some through eBay, my, maybe my online store. And then if I'm lucky enough and I get a few brick and mortar locations, now I'm really in a jam. That's why we need these technologies. And it's still not easy because I decide early on, I'm going to sell five sweaters and I'm going to sell 20% of each. But then I find out for some reason, I'm selling more blue sweaters and more women's sweaters on Amazon. And for some reason, I'm selling more these at the retail location. It is a still of a three-dimensional puzzle that doesn't ever want to be solved. Joe, you're so right. Omnichannel has just created a ton of challenges with data living in different places in different systems, right? And because of that, challenges around creating really seamless experiences for you and I that shop online, we shop in stores, we shop in multiple places online. That omni thing has created a ton of challenges, especially as you think about it from a data perspective, to create seamless consumer experiences. So yes, there's 8,000 opportunities you and I could go deep on in the Omni world. I think about this every once in a while. I say this on my podcast. We are all familiar with Walmart. You can, they have hundreds, 100,000 plus SKUs. Meyer by my house out here in the Midwest, we have Meyer similar to Walmart, a million SKUs. But now we're all familiar with Aldi, um, Trader Joe's, Costco, very few SKUs, much easier to manage, very few SKUs. Even go to Target, their groceries, it's a very curated, very few SKUs. I can see in a world where the where stores, actual stores will have fewer SKUs, many, not all, and 
then if you want it delivered, it'll go through fulfillment, like through warehousing and fulfillment. I can see uh, stores doing that. A lot of born brick and mortar retailers, to your point, really look at e-com from many vantage points, including the ability to be the, that endless aisle. So you're right, like you might not find exactly the right color of a product at your local Myers or Walmarts, but it'll be online. And that digital capability to have that endless aisle is, is a real complement to physical footprint in store that only has so much shelving space. Yeah. And I also think I can see this clothing stores where you go in and you try something on and they'll say, yeah, we'll ship that to you because it fits. And because what we know is we got to get rid of returns. We talked about returns before we hit record. I think the re returns are women's clothing has always been weird sizing. Men's are the same way. I've, I can't believe sometimes when I try something on, I go, how am I wearing this size? It makes no sense. And yeah. we have to do better online with the sizing. I can see where we might get to a point where you, you try stuff on and they say, yeah, we'll ship that to you. Or you, we don't have that right now, but we'll ship that to you. And if I get that, that rare spice from Mexico that I can't usually buy shipped to me the next day or the same day, I don't care. Yeah. And, and real quick comment. I know we did quickly touch on returns at our outset, but I don't know that we want to get rid of returns. I don't think that's the right objective. I think we want to drive better and smarter experiences around returns on a customer individual transaction level basis. So that might look like, Joe, if I knew you were an amazing customer of mine and you bought a lot of stuff and you returned very little, right? It could be as simple as, hey, don't even deal with the hassle, Joe. Just keep it. I'm sending you the right thing. But I know I have such a trust based on all the data that we've had together, all the business we've done together, that I could do something like that. So I think data is going to help with more personalized, smart yes, yes. returns decisions. Yep. I think going upstream of that even, we can do a better job on sizing. My mother always has hot home shopping networks. She doesn't buy a ton of stuff there, but she has it on the background. And my mom's, my mom's in her 80s. She always says, when you watch that, your size, she goes, I bought stuff on there. She goes, They'll have some woman and she says, I'm five foot eight, I'm 175 pounds, and this is the size I'm wearing. And then the next lady comes out, I'm five foot one, I weigh 100 pounds, I'm wearing this size. And you go, that makes sense. Do I find that online? No, <laughs> never. I bought size 10 shoes a million times. And now <laughs> you go online and you buy size 10 shoes. You go, why are these way too small? I get <laughs> Yeah, we're getting really close. We're not there yet. I have a deep passion like you for there's a next generation of technology that's going to be able to build 3D models of your specific feet. Yes. Oh, I get that. I have that right now at Fleet Feet. <laughs> yes. And so I think all of that body scanning technology especially, is becoming real. So the tech is there. I don't think we're there yet from a consumer experience. If I have to use my phone to, to yeah. scan my body from a very precise, um, consistent experience, like I suck at it. Me and every other consumer sucks at it. So not there yet. We're close, Joe. It's around the corner. I think there's a company called M. Taylor that I bought some shirts from and I put my phone on the floor yeah. and then I stood a certain, and then I had to stand like I was going through an airport scanner. That's right. That's exactly the experience. It's, it's good. It's not yet great, but it will be great soon. And then to your point that once that 3D body data exists and the database of the SKU, so this exact shirt and how it fits, right? It's measurements. Then we can start. And by the way, those databases aren't great or mature yet, Joe. So that has to get better. But once we can start matching individual bodies to fit, then I think the game is going to change in terms of returns to your point. Yeah. And then I'll start getting emails from Amazon saying, hey, here's some weight loss pills for you, Joe. <laughs> and all we got <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Damn it. I shouldn't have scanned myself. <laughs> and then our clothes will become our smart wearable devices and be telling us we should have just had the Dairy Queen like I did last night. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I have a better sense for what Shopify does. So if I'm going to have an online store, 
not just an online store, an omni-channel store. I'm going to need a, a something like a Shopify. I know we shouldn't be using it because you love Shopify, but what would be competitors to Shopify? Yeah, there's um, a great competitive landscape. There's uh, Wix, there's Woo, there's Squarespace. So a lot of those platform players play in the small to medium-sized business range. And then as you go up market, there's Salesforce Commerce Cloud. So they bought Demandware in 2016, I think a week after I joined Shopify. And then there's a new trend of more enterprise commerce players that live in what we call the headless commerce space, right? So you have commerce tools and uh, new store and some other exciting um, fabric headless commerce platforms that are, are really built for the enterprise space. So those are some of the competitive landscape if we look at it in the SMB level and look at it at the enterprise level. I love it. I love it. So we want to talk a little, I, I know I'm going to lose you here shortly. So we got to be quick. Tell me about Convoy. We all, I was at TIA last week in San Diego, by the way, everyone should be at TIA. It was awesome. And oh, awesome. I haven't, I've never been to TIA. So it was the Technovations Conference in right in San Diego, which is not a bad place to be in October. And it was an awesome conference, but right in the middle of it, somebody said to me, I was walking around and somebody said, no, I take that back. Somebody from the stage said, yeah, like Convoy. And there was a little uncomfortable giggling, laughing. And I was like, what was that all about? And then somebody said, Convoy went out of business. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And so it was the, all of the talk and we nobody seemed to have the inside scoop or anything, but I want to get your two cents on what went wrong at Convoy. And by the way, we talked a lot more about what went right at Convoy because it has changed things. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So first of all, Convoy, amazing company, amazing talent built, that has built amazing technology. So like, Joe, I know you personally grew up closer to the LTL world, right? So like, it was a highly fragmented, highly small business type of market, if you will. And so Convoy, I think, had built some amazing tools for shippers and suppliers to meet and easily do business together, right, with great visibility. So just wanted to say, this is an amazing set of technology and tools built by an amazing set of people. Like tactically, what I understand, I'm only as good like you as what I read, and I talk to a couple folks that are now leaving Convoy, is there was some venture debt that Convoy had taken out to fund their operations. What is venture debt for those of us not in the finance space? There are venture capitalists that will loan you money um, on debt types of terms, not equity types of terms. And so this was the debt kind of offering. And obviously, is when you and I take personal loans, we got to pay them back at an interest rate. And so... With the interest rates having climbed so oh, dramatically yeah. over the past 12 months, that venture debt payment was due and the interest rate had increased dramatically over the past 12 months. And so it didn't sound like they had the capital or the cash on hand to pay for that debt. That's what I understand. Maybe parts or a whole of that is true, but in all candor, Joe, like, that's not a unique situation. So there are many companies that not only have venture debt, but any debt where that increase in interest rates is going to materially affect the call that's due and the balance sheet that may be not be able to meet it. A similar thing happened to Silicon Valley Bank. I think maybe the lesson learned on the Convoy side or the questions I would have if any of your subsequent guests come from Convoy would really be around, it's really the board's job to work with leadership to make sure like it's really clear when these expiry dates and these milestone payments have to be made and that there's enough liquidity to pay the bills when they come due. So I think that would be my core question for what happened there. Yep. Yep. And by the way, before we hit record, we're talking about in tech in particular, we see, have seen companies grow like a weed that eventually go out of business and or get acquired and you forget that they ever existed. A AOL kind of felt like they invented the internet for most consumers 
where are they? They're long gone. Although I do get emails every once in a while from AOL.com people and you're like, oh, I got an email from 2001. Yeah, <laughs> it's my Yahoo email address. But as I mentioned, I grew up during cop dot com boom one. So I'm deeply wedded to that brand. Yeah. And so we've seen that. But I will say, I believe Convoy showed this industry what it could do. And I think it, in its own way, it upped the game a few percentage points, maybe 10 percentage points, because all of a sudden everyone said, this is possible. And I've interviewed Convoy multiple times on my podcast. I totally agree. And look, there's going to be a lucky buyer of their technology, whether that's you know, C.H. Robinson or Amerisk or a Flexport, we'll see where this lands. But you said it really well. That technology should not die. And, and I hope that can it can be harnessed and built upon with its next owner. And I believe some of the wealthiest men on earth, Colbert Kravis, I think Jeff Bezos was in that. Pierre, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Omidyar, whatever is the eBay guy. So all of a sudden, the, the, the top of the uh, food chain looked at the logistics and supply chain world and said, that's an interesting space. We should invest in it. Great investors. And they had a ton of resources and they built a lot of good stuff. It just sounds like somehow the capital call on the debt came without enough on the liquidity side to pay for it. And by the way, this is the power of the United States market is that we can have these and there can be failure. And that, by the way, in, in the a lot of the world failure is so frowned upon that you go, oh my God, anybody who worked at Convoy, oh, shame on them. This is awful. I know no one wants to lose money. No one wants to have to write loans off, but these guys did something special over there. So they will be welcome in many companies. People are going to say, I was part of the whole rock. I mean, 2023 has been a fascinating year, Joe, with the rise of the interest rates and how it's impacting these venture funded companies, right? These venture backed companies. So we're seeing that every day, all day with founders that raised last year at very high valuations or two years ago at these really high valuations that now when calibrated, given the current interest rate and the current investing market are just, uh, are candidly having to be recalibrated. Yes. So I think the convoy experience is something that's living in a much broader context that we're seeing even from an early stage investor perspective. Yep. So VCs like you are still building great companies, are still making big bets. What interest companies like Forum right now? Yeah, so we are a B2B SaaS early stage pre-seed investor. So I think that's going to helpfully frame where Maya's lens is coming from. But that's a really rich landscape for all things logistics. So next gen logistics, e-com and supply chain are my personal and professional background and experience set and where I spend probably about 60%, 65% of my time, Joe. And so big trends in those spaces won't surprise you, but I'll maybe frame out a couple. One is all things AI and ML, which aren't new, but now we're bringing in generative AI, which is new, right? So we're seeing a ton of really fun and exciting applications coming in on the gen gen AI side for stuff like supply chain data. So how do you take your expensive data teams that have very limited resources and deep backlogs and really democratize the insights that you and I need on hand like now, and so tons of really exciting stuff on the Gen AI world. So that's a big trend. Other trends I get really excited about in logistics and supply chain is what I call eyes on the eyes in the sky. So computer vision, right? In warehouses, in yards, at the gates as the trucks are going in and out. Um, we're doing some investing in kind of a, a lot of the computer vision value chain. And that's that would be part of IoT, right? So IoT and so far as like the camera is the thing, right? But we're investing on the software that lives through the camera. No, I know. Have I know VCs hate the physical world, but so I knew you'd want to date. Not all there. VCs. <laughs> not all VCs. Like, we're actually not afraid of investing in kind of core software platforms that do have a hardware component. So not everybody. We're not afraid of that. In fact, we, we're making an investment now in a model like that. But, but yeah, I think all things computer vision to really digitize and get data real time on what's happening in the physical world 
drive down costs or increase revenue is so exciting. Imagine being able to count inventory in a warehouse real time based on computer vision. Imagine being able to see theft in a yard real time because of in computer vision. Imagine being able to marry cabs to their exact trailers to know the comings and goings real time, to see the truck real time. Does it have a flat tire? Is it about to have a flat tire? Does it sound funny? So anyway, really exciting applications. I would say big data and, and computer vision are two great trends we're investing in. Yeah, I love well, the reason I bring up the IoT uh, angle to it because I, again, this is always in my head is on time delivery. And right now, if I was shipping something for you, I'd say, oh, it arrived at eleven fifty nine because it had to be there by noon. And you'd say, Joe, if we had objective data, which we don't always have, you would be able to say, oh, here's the here's where the signature was. Better yet, if I could have a gate that said that truck arrived at ten a.m. And we're, we're not going to discuss whether it was on time or not, because we know when it got there, we have objective information. And by the way, could t- that could be tied to payments at some point where you, where you say. Totally. And for computer vision, you'd have to tag it in some way. So you'd need that thing to do the tracking to your point. Now we've got eyes. Now we don't even need the things. We just got the eyes. So yeah, incredibly meaningful data. Yeah. And I see it in a much also... We all know areas where we live where you go, oh, that's not a safe area. I keep thinking, I can't wait till we're able to use technology to say, we're going to make that neighborhood safe for the people living in it. Because <laughs> so much of the problem we have is related to these people who are living in spaces where you go, oh, life is meaningless because I live in a dangerous neighborhood. It's hard. So that's yeah. getting way off track, but I see we a lot no, of opportunity. No, Yes, in the sky can be very valuable for all sorts of applications, including safety, just like you're saying. It just also incumbent with that is an immense amount of responsibility, right? Because this is highly sensitive, in many cases, personal and private data. So I think how we make sure that's protected. Oh, my God. Yeah. I just talked to uh, Drone Up the other day, to uh, Tom Walker from there. And I said, oh, yeah, you can take a picture of when you deliver something for Walmart. And he said, we can, but we don't because no one wants a drone flying around taking pictures at your house. I was like, oh my God, yes. Uh, yeah, because we right now say, I take a picture when it's on your porch, which we all think, oh, isn't that great? Not if I say, oh yeah, that dropped uh, and put it in my backyard. Here's a picture of my backyard for everybody. Yeah, or not if my two-year-old's picking up the package as you're taking the picture of the delivery, right? Right. So anyway. We, we love these eyes in the sky. We love the digital and the image data. We just need to be very thoughtful about the application and the security. Yeah. So Maya, great talking to you. I know you have to go. Give us your final thoughts on a SaaS girl, gal in a VC land. Wrap this up. Put a bow on it. I, it's been a hell of a year being an investor, right? So if you just think about the world we've been living in, we went from tremendous tailwinds of basically free money to massive headwinds as the interest rate risk, as the interest rates have been increasing and the risk has been increasing against that. So lower deployment of capital. On the flip side, we've never candidly seen as high a quality of founders founding companies, right? So if you can exist, survive, and thrive in a world with limited or less resources by definition, Joe, you're going to get better outcomes. So we're really fortunate Forum. We are leaning into this moment in time. Our investors behind Forum are leaning into this moment in time because we know the companies that are born in this cohort or this vintage are going to outperform the rest because they've got leaner, meaner resources and they have to solve a problem that directly ladders up to less cost or more revenue, right? So they have to really have a reason for existing. So that's the exciting part of it. Commiserate with all this market world. We've got Gen AI that has just come in, right? And so that's another kind of platform shift and another technology that's just made the past year unbelievably interesting. So it's an amazing time to be in venture capital. And when I, your company form, they're the ones who write the first check into these companies. And I think that's exciting for people who are listening to my podcast who are still small and saying, oh, it's a VC, but VCs always do 
Series B, you have to be really big before you get to talk to them. No, we love early, early stage founders. We're seeing a lot of amazing talent spitting out of some of the companies you and I have discussed, founding companies. So Forum is really excited to talk to you if you're building first ever tech that can be sold kind of B2B. So would, would welcome any founders. Just find me at my at Forum VC. Can't wait to talk to you. What I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, a link to your website and any of the links you and your marketing team give me. I like to interview rock stars like you, Maya. Who else should I interview? Well, I love that you <laughs> asked this question. I love that this is a part of your standard format. So I think there's a couple folks you might want to talk to in our shared fun logistics space. So Scott at Pandian Pro, I'd recommend talking to. Harish, the founder of Deliver, you should talk to. Amit, the founder and CEO of Narvar, speaking of returns, I think would be fun to talk to. And then there's an awesome guy, ex-Flexport guy called Kyle Burton. It's the founder of Two Boxes. All right. That, I, I, I am connected, I think, to all of these guys on LinkedIn, and they are all on my radar. So hopefully you can get me their emails if I don't have them. And you got it. what conferences will we see you in the and the forum folks. Well, Jeff, I think I'll look forward to seeing you and many at Manifest and Feb in Vegas. So and you are a gonna... speaker there, right? What are you talking about there? <laughs> Being on AI and data, not surprising. So I can't wait to see you there. Come, come and clap, Joe, and bring some good questions. Excellent, excellent. Well, Maya, thank you so much for taking the time today. My pleasure, Joe. Nice to see you. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.